Okay. okay, so I think we are ready to start. Thank you, Gideon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. Thank you all so much for joining us. We are, I hope you are as excited as I am. We have the great privilege of having Maria Oxmith with us this afternoon uh, for a two hour, up to two hours masterclass. Uh, I'm sure you all know Maria, but let's just reintroduce, let me just reintroduce her for those of you who don't know. She's the founder and director of the Art International Housing Finance Program at the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. She has, she has advised many, many governments uh, in pri and private and non-profit clients in emerging market and developing countries in the field of housing and housing finance policy. She, uh, um, she's a member of the advisory board of the Habitat for Humanity Terrigal Center for Innovation in Shelter and uh, also the founder and executive director of the HOFINET, the Housing Finance Information Network, a global web portal that consolidate international housing finance information and statistical data for public use that we use very often at CAF uh, in our research and for our data analytics. So Maya is a great friend of CAF uh, and a mentor, and uh, we are very excited to have her with us uh, today. So Maya, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, I'll mute myself and turn off the video, but uh, I'll, I'll be online. So if there is anything, just say my name or give your name, and we'll be we'll be here to assist. Okay. All right. Thank lovely. you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So first, uh, is my screen shared at the moment? No, not yet. Not yet. No. So let me wait. Um, I cannot see myself, so I will just say hello to everyone who is participating in this class. Uh, and this is just to give you a little taste of um, the course that we do for Sub-Saharan Africa, um, together with uh, Cape Town University and Wharton. And that course will take place uh, in uh, January uh, 21. Uh, so from the 18th to the 29th. So that is a full class uh, and this is just one part of it uh, where we are going to talk about uh, extending access to housing finance for low income earners. So it is the downward um, trend in accessing housing finance as far as more is and we will talk about the upward, upward trend of microfinance. Um, so those are, if we have time, and I hope we have, uh, we will also talk about the role of subsidies. M Maria? Is um, it, everything fine so far? We can yeah. hear you very well, but we still don't see the slide. I don't know if you have started to share yet your, your uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, because, because yeah, I have. Still is there Gideon? I don't know if you're online. Is there anything she must, an additional step she must take? Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Just, just make sure that you've shared your screen on Hopin. Shared my screen on Hopin. Yeah, I have, I have shared my screen. Share your screen. I have. Mm. It's right. not popping up on our Hopin. end. So, so maybe just retry that. Yeah. Share. There we go. Okay. Yeah, no, that's yeah. fine. That's sharing, Is yes. Sharing? So you can just switch to back to your presentation. I can switch back to my presentation. So how do so I just do open that? your PowerPoint? Okay. Oh boy. Okay, it should be good now. It should be good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, perfect. We can so see it very well. Yeah. So. Just just go full screen for us so everyone can see it properly, please. Right. Yeah, there we go. Go. I have now full Perfect. screen. So, <laughs> okay. All right. Let me start then. 
Um, so I will, um, of course, for all the people that are in this conference, uh, I'm first um, preaching a little bit uh, to the converted already. Everyone in this conference knows that the pressure on affordable housing in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in urban areas, is enormous. Um, we have the highest urban growth in the world uh, in taking place in sub-Saharan Africa and in India as well, but sub-Saharan Africa even more. Um, prices of land and housing, and again, you all will know that, are increasing and incomes are not keeping track with the cost of housing. Uh, and that is a recipe for disaster for affordable housing. Uh, then there is the point that we have very little access to housing finance uh, and therefore um, we have a stagnating supply um, in the affordable sector of housing. And that affordable sector, I want to say from the start, uh, is not just for the poor. It is a very broad segment of society, uh, working folks uh, at the middle income level that all suffer from lack of housing. Um, so that's very important when we talk about what we have to do um, in the housing finance area. It is not just for the poor. Um, the middle income people have no access to finance and no access to housing. And the two, of course, feed on each other. If I don't have finance, my developers are not going uh, to build housing for that sector. Um, they will only build um, housing for a particular sector uh, if the people can have access to mortgages and the developer can pay and get out of it in order to build more housing. So um, we have a, a broad problem, broader in its scope and scale than anywhere in the world, actually. Uh, and we all agree, indeed, again, this is preaching to the converted already, uh, that uh, housing finance is the critical piece. Uh, it increases uh, the affordability to pay um, and to improve um, existing housing, if you can get access uh, to a home improvement loan. Um, it leverages housing, uh, household savings. Um, and without finance, as I just mentioned, we don't have mass housing coming into the market. Um, so housing finance is no longer uh, a, a sort of a little niche market that uh, we can ignore. Uh, it is the core of the housing solution. And that is why you are all attending this conference. Um, so the vision that I have for this short lecture is that, uh, and for, in general, um, and for the course that we teach in Cape Town, um, the vision is that you want to move to a completely integrated housing finance system. And in most of Sub-Saharan Africa, we have little pieces of it, but they don't connect. So what we want to talk about today is to deepen the mortgage markets down market uh, for all households that are credit worthy, uh, whether they are formally or informally employed, whether they are small landlords wanting to extend their current housing with rental units or homeowners, it doesn't matter. Everyone who is credit worthy and wants to buy or extend or improve a home should be able to go to the mortgage market to get a loan. So we are first talking about that part. We deepen the mortgage market and then we look at the microfinance sector, which is in most countries very, very small in scale. And we are going to look at what is happening there and how we can actually uh, increase the scale of microfinance so that the two markets in housing finance, the one for secured lending with a lien and everything, and the other for unsecured lending actually begin to merge. Uh, and we cover the entire housing market um, with access to finance. If that is done properly, then we will 
and the credit records are kept from uh, the microfinance lenders as well as from the mortgage market, of course. So if people build up a credit record when they get loans in the microfinance sector and therefore mortgage market um, lenders understand the clientele through the credit record, many people that receive microfinance loans earlier in life can graduate uh, to a mortgage loan much easier. When that system works well, and it is beginning to work well in some sub-Saharan African, African countries like Rwanda, when people improve their economic status or when they have to move to a different neighborhood uh, because uh, of their jobs, they can then much easier sell their current home and move to a house uh, that suits their status or is better located relative to their jobs. When that market begins to really work well, uh, mobility um, is uh, increasing uh, and people do not have to stay in one house, even if that means that they have to commute for two hours or more. Uh, so that is the vision, and that is the vision that, of course, exists um, without the microfinance piece, uh, but in advanced economies where people have access to the mortgage market all the way down to um, the very poor uh, in society. Uh, so, but in emerging markets, we still need uh, a lot of that non-secured lending in the market. Um, because we have so many people in uh, the informal sector, both um, in housing as well as in jobs. Uh, so the non-secured market still has to play a major role in sub-Saharan Africa. So this is the vision that we are going to work towards. So this is how I uh, have structured the lecture, uh, but I can go any which way, um, and Olivier has, uh, Vidal uh, is on the call and he can um, alert me uh, to the chat questions uh, if you have any. We can talk more about uh, different parts that are of interest to the audience than other parts. But this is what I have laid out myself. So the first part of the lecture, we are going to look at what we can do uh, as lenders and regulators particularly uh, to push the mortgage market frontier uh, down market, as we call it, uh, to people that are now not served by mortgages. The second component, um, we will look at the microfinance sector for housing uh, and address the constraint in that sector at the moment but also the innovations that are taking place. Then if we have time and as much as we have time, uh, we will look at the role of subsidies uh, because the affordability gap in Sub-Saharan Africa between prices and incomes are such that subsidies are needed. And we are looking at two types of subsidies. We look at subsidies through the lenders and subsidies directly to households. And we will discuss what are very good subsidies and what are uh, have proven to be um, marginal and not so good subsidies. Um, we are not going to talk about supply side issues and supply developer finance in this lecture. We stick uh, to household um, and rent or uh, rent or landlord, small landlord uh, finance, but not developer finance. That is a wholly different topic. Uh, and if you want to know more about that, you have to attend the course in, uh, in Cape Town. So if everyone is fine with that agenda, um, let me then go um, to the first topic. But first I want to check whether I'm coming across fine, it's whether perfect, you can uh, all hear me. Excellent. So, yeah, very good. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, then I will go ahead and interrupt me no if problem. I will. something goes wrong. <laughs> Technology, I, no yeah, I have, I have learned my lesson in this, uh, this last couple of months and know that, that there is always a glitch. So let's start with the mortgage frontier and how we can push that out um, to lower incomes and informally employed. The, the underserved, I call that group. That is a broad group, uh, not at all homogeneous. Um, when you look at this graph, uh, you see the pink, I will put my cursor there, Sub-Saharan Africa is pink all the way. Uh, this graph shows the mortgage sector size relative to the GDP of the country. Uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa, as is no surprise to all of you, uh, has very small numbers. Even South Africa, which is this column, uh, is um, as a very well-developed economy, has a tiny mortgage market. And what is more worrisome in um, South Africa is that the mortgage, the size of the mortgage market has actually over the last de decade come down uh, relative to GDP uh, rather than go up. So something is not working well in the mortgage market. And it is not just only poverty that people can't afford housing. So we are going to look at all of those things. Um, when we look more globally, we know that mortgage markets increase with GDP. So part indeed of sub-Saharan Africans' problem is that incomes are very low. Um, and therefore, um, you can expect that the mortgage debt relative to C GDP is very low. Look at this uh, global picture. These are 111 countries for which I had on the HOFINET site, which is a data site that I maintain at Wharton. Uh, you can see that for very low, the lowest income countries, um, mortgage debt to GDP is only 3%. For advanced, very high income countries, um, it is 58% uh, of GDP. So there is a clear progression according to economic growth. Um, however, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we cannot wait for that growth to take place in order to solve the housing problem. Uh, we had that luxury in other countries where urbanization took place in a calm fashion according to the economic development of the countries. What we see at the moment in Sub-Saharan Africa is that economic growth is still very low and economic, um, the, the incomes per capita are still very low, yet urbanization is hitting the, the continent with a vengeance. So Sub-Saharan Africa is in a very different situation um, at this level of urbanization compared to, for instance, Latin America, when they went through their urbanization spurt. It urbanizes as a, at a much lower income level. And that puts the stress on the affordable housing market. So we can't just wait quietly in the bushes until the mortgage market extends on its own. We have to be much more proactive in Sub-Saharan Africa. So that is the context and that is the urgency that we face. Um, and we have to just all work together as a public and private sector um, to make that sector um, expand at a much faster rate than otherwise. So what are the policies and um, what are the innovations uh, and the constraints that we face? And that is the topic, of course, of where we are heading. We have some fundamental weaknesses in most of the Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and that was in the past particularly the macroeconomic volatility. But that has improved enormously in the last couple of decades. We have now, of course, hit a particularly nasty spot in economic growth because of COVID, 
but not that much on the volatility of the macroeconomy. Um, that has stabilized remarkably over the last decade. We also, and that is the bigger problem at the moment still uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have an impaired uh, property rights system. Uh, so much of our urban areas uh, are not registered in the cadaster. And that a core limitation for mortgage lending. Uh, if you have to put a lien uh, on the property, you have to have a registered uh, property. Uh, in the cadastro system and that still is not working well but I have enormous hopes uh, of the new technology uh, kicking in at the moment so the digital the, the drone technology that can speed up uh, mapping of land uh, and therefore the, uh, the digitalization of the cadastres so that part has enormous potential uh, to speed up, uh, therefore, the mortgage sector. But that is a structural constraint that, um, that is part and parcel uh, of sub-Saharan African housing markets. Uh, and then we have a lot of private and public sector institutions that have a lot of market power. And that market power can be so pervasive that there is no room for competition and therefore no room for innovation and expansion. So if you have a major mortgage lender uh, from the public sector, let's say we have Nigeria, um, that major public lender can make mortgages at 6%. It's very hard um, for the private sector and then compete with um, the public institutions and only the top end of the market that do not qualify for government loans will expensive um, 16 18 percent mortgage loans in the private sector we have the same vice versa we can have a private sector that doesn't want to really go down market for a lot of institutional reasons and they the private lending sector may collude together um, to hinder the expansion of the mortgage sector. And that is happening in several countries as well. These are structural market failures that have to be addressed more or less outside the mortgage sector itself. So we leave those alone uh, for other conversations. What we are going to focus on today is what we call the incomplete credit markets particularly. So the risks and the costs for lenders in order to move down market or to the informally employed are simply too high um, to go to that spot. And that is where we are particularly focus, focusing on in this lecture. Uh, how can we reduce the risks and the cost to lenders to take care of informally employed frontier low-income households um, other underserved. Um, the reason is often that information uh, and that they are working in an environment where both property price information is not well understood as well as employment and income information uh, is not available. Um, and, of course, the major problem is that um, the incomes are very low relative to house prices and that is where subsidies may play a role. So that is the structure globally of the market. So let's look at that credit risk piece, which is absolutely the major concern for lenders. Lenders have other concerns as well they may think that they don't want to tie up their uh, loan portfolio in too much mortgage loans um, because mortgage loans are anywhere from 10 to 20 years. They may find that they don't have access 
to long-term funding sufficiently to uh, expand um, their mortgage portfolios. So there are funding constraints as well, but I'm not going to talk much about those um, because I know that in uh, during your sessions, uh, this is coming up uh, regularly, and we are now getting uh, in many countries access to long-term funding through liquidity facilities um, and other mechanisms to access capital markets. So, but also a major constraint uh, that funding uh, area. So. We focus, because we only have a, a short time, on the credit risk. And we split up that credit risk in two components. Um, we want to lower the probability that people default. And we are going to look at different mechanisms to lower the original probability of default. And then the second area we want to look at is once a default occurs, how can we lower the loss to the lender um, in order in the process of getting access uh, to the house and uh, making um, getting back what he is owed uh, on the outstanding balance uh, of the loan and um, outstanding payments? How can we lower that loss? for the lender so that the lenders are more confident to come into that margin market to move gradually down market so we look at the loan to value ratios we look at data um, on uh, improved data on housing values in the neighborhood so that underwriting can be done uh, better we look at the debt to income ratio guidelines, uh, prudential regulations, and the credit bureau. Uh, and I will do that in short order because many of you are lenders and you know all this. So, but let me give you a few um, um, figures uh, to think about uh, all these issues. So, of course, when you lower the loan to value ratio, um, then the probability of default decreases dramatically. Here we have a graph from seven countries, uh, the averages, and you can see with increasing loan to value, if you come to 95% loan to the value of the house, uh, the default uh, rates are increasing dramatically. So it's very important that the uh, customer um, will save up for the down payment so that we have a reasonable down payment and a reasonable loan to value, which will indeed help most of all for the probability of default. And then we are talking later on about subsidies very often what is the most helpful of subsidies is to put a, a subsidy towards the down payment. So you have the customer save up for let's say 10, 15, 20% of the house price. Then you add to that an, an, um, a down payment subsidy so that the loan to value uh, decreases dramatically. That also will, of course, lower the loan amount and therefore the affordability. So that type of subsidy has proven in other countries to be both excellent for the lender, uh, gives him more security as well as uh, great benefits uh, in affordability to uh, the customer, the borrower. So the loan to value is um, one important area to look at and how you can uh, bring that loan to value down. The uh, second point I want to emphasize is that information piece, that underwriting, particularly of self-employed customers. And we see enormous progress in this area. 
Um, we see that in the United States and in many emerging markets, these underwriting techniques with new digital uh, technology uh, and personalized surveys have improved dramatically. And it is not as static uh, as it once was. You know, you look at employment, you look at income, uh, and it, it is a static picture. Um, these, the way to capture the full uh, employment income, both formally and informally, has made enormous uh, progress. And I will talk about uh, at the Indian lenders, the, the mortgage lenders there, not the banks, but the housing finance companies in India that are really um, in the world the most advanced in um, understanding how uh, you actually can uh, underwrite customers with informal incomes. Uh, but that area is much, much in movement. So I have great hopes uh, for that. Um, and here I have uh, a slide to show that information is used very, very innovatively um, of smartphone users and link it to their credit profile. Um, we have um, this India shelter, I take as one example, um, enormous progress on underwriting informal customers. Uh, in the beginning, they started this company with detailed interviewing and so on and so forth. But then they began to, um, uh, to establish a database. For instance, the Bechak drivers in Bangalore, one city. Uh, they began to understand the income profile, which is all informal, of that particular employment group. They did the same with fruit sellers and so on. And they did it on a very detailed basis, case by case, uh, until they had enough cases to really come up with them for that sector of informally employed. And but therefore, when, when you are a Bechak driver and you come and you work in a particular area of Bangalore, there is a database, GIS-based, that immediately understands the scale of your income in that informal um, employment sector and in that part of the city. Uh, and that has proven to be very robust. And therefore, they have been able uh, to ending mostly to informal workers. And then, we had the central bank in India come in, approve, not penalize um, this lending because the, uh, the to the informal um, because it proved indeed to be robust and it didn't drive up uh, default rates. So that is one wonderful example that sub-Saharan Africa lenders uh, can learn a lot from. Um, the second part of that underwriting um, is uh, how, who they take on as customers. What, um, what factors you have to come, you have to have your kids in school. Um, the wife, the woman has to sign the mortgage agreement. Um, you have to be enrolled uh, in a health program. So you have a lot of underwriting criteria that you have to comply with, and that gives comfort uh, to uh, the lenders. So the, um, that part, that whole underwriting part, uh, is taking off, and we should all pay attention. Um, the other uh, factor that is very important and has proven very critical in lowering default is mortgage education. And again, I can understand, I, I know that most of you understand that already. We need very innovative technologies for appraisal of um, that are a little bit, they may have property titles, but they are not 
in the normal urban areas as we know them. They may be a bit outside. Um, and new techniques uh, like Google Earth uh, can understand and the use of GIS used widely to understand the value of those properties, even though they are the normal uh, realm and we don't have a deep market for those properties, but they can now be included uh, in the mortgage portfolio. Uh, and then, of course, you have to have some when you use um, land registration systems that are based on drone mapping rather than on our, um, you know, um, uh, coordinate measures on the ground, you have to get this, the uh, central bank to approve uh, those um, registration systems uh, so that a lien can actually be used, even though the mapping is based on new technologies and not the conventional technologies. I'm stopping here for one second to know whether there are questions in my box. For I so, can't see my box. Thank you, Maya. There, uh, one question from Jody. How do we best adapt digital fintech innovation in underwriting income and credit assessment from India to challenging African financial market? What is needed to bring these new products to market? Actually, much. You all have the same technology. And so it is basically um, the collaboration between the lenders, the, techni the technological firms, but you don't even need these India lenders do not use tech firms. They use technology that is freely available like GIS, Google Earth, uh, they use the free um, technology that is available. So this is not rocket science, actually, and that can be immediately applied uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. There was nothing. I've been sitting with these Indian lawyers, uh, with it, these Indian lenders, in their outfits. It is all um, understood technology that you have access to. They don't even begin to use blockchain, which now at the moment is more used. Uh, in the underwriting or beginning to be used uh, in the whole underwriting process uh, in sub-Saharan Africa countries. But again, blockchain is just a matter of organizing your information in particular folders that you give access to, to different parties. There is, there is no mystery in blockchain. It's just very useful. Um, and everyone can apply it. So, no. Um, you have everything that India has, um, so you can do the same thing. Any other question? I was on mute. Yes, Maria. What, another question from Olu. What comes? Uh, what comes first? Expanding the market by bringing in the informal market or increasing liquidity for mortgage banks? Um, if the banks are really not liquid, um, which is not the case in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, then of course you have to work simultaneously uh, to bring more liquidity uh, to the banks. Um, but at the same time, you can put all your systems um, to get ready for underwriting of the informally employed. So one doesn't have to wait for the other. Um, it is not as if when you open up to the informal sector, all of a sudden you have hundreds and hundreds of customers uh, that come to you for a loan. This is building up slowly. People in the informal sector have to get used to taking on debt um, and so on and so forth. So, but yeah, if the banking system is really constrained and the capital market for corporate debt, for instance, are very small, um, then other mechanisms have to be put in place uh, to expand your funding base. Um, and that process is now very well understood. Kenya, Nigeria, Tanzania, 
all have liquidity facilities uh, to help lenders with that. But Kenya already, the lenders had access to the capital markets for corporate debt. So dependent on this liquidity facility and still are not. They can go ahead um, and begin to underwrite and get together to underwrite informal Thank um, you, Maya. Customers. Another question from Eduardo. Would you consider the presence of alternatives to banking like mobile money served by mobile network operator like in Kenya? Do you think their presence will change the banking system and make it more inclusive? Oh, absolutely 100%. <laughs> and I have a slide on that as well later on. Uh, critical, because that will, um, that will lower the cost. So it's not only the risk that the bankers take, but it is the cost of doing business. So many people don't have a street address. Um, you know, uh, simple that make um, indeed collections, they don't have a bank account, that make collections very uh, costly. And when that can be digitized, moment, uh, particularly not in all countries equally. Kenya, of course, is at the top uh, of mobile banking, but uh, other countries are following suit. And that can bring the cost down uh, of doing business for our customers with smaller smaller customers is not smaller loans um, that are very costly to administer uh, and service so then you have a smaller loan so if i make a loan for the mercedes-benz uh, car uh, i make one loan uh, for a hundred thousand uh, dollars if i do a little car i have to make to 10 loans, um, you know, to come to that same amount and therefore 10 times my administrative. So small loans are more costly and we all know it and the lenders know it very well. Um, so if that cost can be brought down by, uh, by technology. Um, okay. I'm just reading you two more questions and then yeah. I'm letting you continue. Uh, so we have a, a question from Abel. Uh, inter in terms of policy, yeah. how can government and private sector come together to design the framework necessary to address low-income housing shortage in sub-Saharan Af Africa? That's one. And another question from Om Omolara. In India, are these underwriting of the informal sector driven by the government or private sector, financial institution and real estate firms? You want me to repeat the questions? The, um, yeah. Let me first start. No, no, uh, let me first start with the first question. Um, that is the conclusion of this slideshow. How can they come together? Uh, and I can already talk <laughs> to that conclusion. Um, willingness of both the private sector and the government sector. No willingness to debate how this can be done how the regulatory system needs to address very important issues for the lenders. And the lenders really think that, for instance, consumer lending makes them a lot more money than mortgage lending, and they are really not interested in moving to a new market. No conversation. And that has been a big problem um, in several countries, uh, and I'm calling out here um, South Africa. There is no trust between the two parties. And the really of the lenders, and um, the, uh, there is distrust uh, to the lenders uh, by the government, and particularly the housing. So you really need to break down the distrust amongst the parties and come with sincerity that you want to make and an understanding that once you find the key to open up this market, it is superb for the profits for uh, the mortgage sector as well as service goals of the government. If both parties understand what is at stake, 
the private sector for their profit motives uh, and the public sector for their public good um, uh, goals, um, then you have a good way of talking together. And in some countries, that is happening. Um, I am a colleague uh, that is beginning to really understand how to work together with the two parties. Then all of a sudden you can see that this is moving very rapidly. And that is exactly what happened uh, roughly 15 years ago uh, in India. Now on India, um, what was the question precisely? Is the, yeah, these uh, India lenders, uh, are whether these they got of uh, the informal support sector from the government? by the government or private sector? No. Uh, totally private sector. These housing finance companies found that there was this niche that no one was serving, that the banks were not serving, that these big housing finance companies like HFC in India were not serving. And they just zoomed in on that sector and tried to make it profitable. And they did. Um, the government's only was to facilitate the regulatory environment uh, in the beginning. So what do I mean by that? That the central bank didn't penalize these um, lenders for making more risky loans. So they didn't have to put aside more risk capital and all of that. Once the central bank understood, the regulator understood that they um, were a very tight book and knew what they were doing and the default rates were very small, um, there was no penalty for those loans. Later on, but that was actually later uh, and more recent, um, they instituted a PPP-based mortgage insurance system in India. And that mortgage insurance system, I'm going to talk about it in a second, but we can as well start uh, in answering this question, that PPP mortgage insurance system had two components for the formally employed, the normal customers, and one for more risky customers. And in the part for risky customers, uh, informally employed and the like, the government took a much larger share um, of the risk. So that is a very helpful mechanism, and I'm going to talk about that in Thank just you. a minute. I will let you continue yeah. your, your presentation. There are a few questions that I'm writing down where we, we can address them at a later stage. But I'm, I'm writing uh, all the questions now, yeah. just for the participants. Okay. Yeah, and may, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe I come uh, to that in the presentation. So this was uh, India. So the other thing lenders can begin to think about, uh, and that's very common, uh, including in India, but also elsewhere, is to use a flexible mortgage to deal with irregular incomes. So you create an amortization schedule uh, that allows for irregular income flows, you know, seasonal work, when there are festivals, people may not be able to pay that month forth. You want to create a system to schedule some overpayments up front in maybe account. Say save up for a few payments so that if there is a case that if there is a time that you cannot make your pay you are allowed to take it from the escrow account. So you don't run behind in your normal payments. So um, there are all these mechanisms creative lenders are very successfully using at the moment. And then of course you can accept as a lender alternative collateral uh, if you are not sure that there is a market for a particular property. That property as I said may have a title but it may not be a mainstream market property. And so as a lender, you will not know how quickly you can sell that property. And then you can tap into uh, other types of collateral, including uh, So the use of flexible mortgages with more flexible uh, collateral um, has worked in many countries 
uh, and is absolutely very important that irregular income uh, earners. So that is um, the, the third. Uh, the fourth one is community-based mortgages. And I'm bringing that up, particularly in Africa, where communal land is so prevalent. So there are three components to a mortgage payment. We have to pay for land, for services, and for the superstructure. In several countries, that is split up. So the land and the services, a uh, communal piece of land are paid for by the community. Once that property is now owned by the community, the superstructure can get an individual loan uh, for construction or if it is an upgrading uh, area for the upgrading of the home. Um, and that includes a sort of partnership, public-private community partnership. And uh, for instance, here in Philadelphia, but also in Costa Rica, in Brazil now, we have these special entity land trusts that um, are communally owned lands. The individual has limited title. They have title to, the, to their own plot and they can bequeath it, they can give it to their kids and all that, but they cannot independently sell the property without involvement of the community. That makes that um, the gentrification of well-located land can be contained. And it also means that there is some um, comfort for lenders that make loans uh, that there is a market uh, for the property. So these community land trusts are very common at the moment at all in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but they have been very successful. We have just formed now because of the homelessness that we face in Philadelphia, where we have just formed two new community land trusts. Um, existing of vacant buildings that the city put together in a trust for the homeless to upgrade and own, but on a community basis, not individual home ownership. So that is both very good for uh, the affordability, but also for the trust that, uh, particularly if the government has a stake in it, um, for lenders to make loans uh, to people that are part of the trust. So um, successful, as I say, in Brazil, now applied uh, in the US uh, and so on. So a community land trust lower both the probability of default that people cannot pay for the loan uh, because basically they only have a loan for the superstructure or the improvement of the superstructure and the loss given default because there is a community behind it. So it's certainly something to watch and there is a lot of experience with it in the Philippines in the upgrading of slums uh, where the people themselves, the occupants, community mortgage buy the land together from the private owner uh, whose land they squat upon. So that's, um, I want to plan that uh, in your mind. So that is all about the lowering the probability of default. Um, so smart underwriting is at the very, very core of that conversation. And I'm moving now to how you can um, limit the loss once you have a default. Uh, and there are a number of important um, mechanisms that you can think about. Um, and um, the first one is that you want to um, improve um, the legal obstacles to enforce credit laws. So if you can put in place non-judicial systems at the time that it takes to get access as a lender to the property that is in default uh, is much, much lower. 
uh, you can see on this graph, uh, I will make the slides available, but it is, uh, you can see it, this is the time that it takes um, to get the property in foreclosure. So um, all the countries that have gone away, moved away from the court system says to the property, do much, much better for the lender. Uh, and it's also not bad for the owner who is defaulting with his life in the first place. And there are, of course, uh, protective uh, measures in place uh, so that he's not kicked out right away, uh, but they cannot um, draw out that uh, timeline very long. The other mechanism I want to focus on which is very important and opened the Brazil mortgage market, which is an enormous one, eh? and Brazil is a big country. And that is the trust deed mortgage. That is similar to, a, but it is a little bit different in the following sense. It has the same term, 15 to 20 years, but the deed to the property is placed in a third party entity, an institution. It is not with the bank and it is not with the owner of the property. And the deed is really only transferred to the buyer when he fully pays off the loan. I know that most lenders um, take the deed, but it is not really in their owner uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. And that was not at all the case also in Brazil. In this mechanism, there is really, you don't register a mortgage. The deed is put in that third party mechanism, legal supervisor uh, over that mortgage, over that deed. Um, and indeed there is, a trans, uh, there is an agreement that you only will become the full owner if you have fully paid. The benefit is, that the lender can access the property much faster, of course, with approval of that legal entity that holds the deed. But that has avoided the high cost of registration of mortgages uh, and only you have to only register the mortgage uh, at the point of default. And it has protected uh, lenders and borrowers. So it's an enormous benefit that was instituted in Brazil in 2000. And after 2000, you, you see the mortgage market in Brazil grow enormously because they did not want, the lenders did not want to deal with the courts. The courts were always ruling in favor of the borrower, the underdog, and the banks were always losing. So they didn't come into the mortgage sector. So uh, that um, trust deed mortgage is something that in the areas, in the countries where there is really big distrust in sub-Saharan Africa, and you have many, between lenders and customers, between lenders and government, this is a mechanism that you should take seriously. So that is the second way to deal with that loss once there is a default, very important. And then here is my credit insurance. Um, so develop credit insurance. And you may think of developing credit insurance case, uh, one for the normal mortgage portfolio and one for informally employed, the high risk. Government in South Africa's case, before, for instance, the, um, the NHC uh, uh, to take uh, a larger part of the credit risk. That once you have mortgage insurance uh, that ensures the top part of the loan, not the whole loan, but the loan. Uh, you can go to much higher LTV ratios. Uh, that is one big benefit when um, you don't have subsidies and you savings option in the country because people don't save. Um, so uh, the mortgage insurance allow you, allows you to go to higher loan to value ratios. 
um, and it takes uh, various collateral risks um, and um, therefore uh, and loss given default. Uh, so you can create, if that is not yet possible, um, sorry, I'm going backwards. Uh, this is how it works, uh, mortgage insurance. So you cover this part, the 20K on a 100K house. Um, the top part of the loan uh, is insurance company. The borrower put in 5K in this example. Um, so the loan to value is 95. Uh, the mortgage insurance company, in case of default, pays out a maximum of 20K. And the lender retains um, the remainder of the risk. Now, when you deal with very risky um, you can also, of course, uh, enlarge that piece. That will just translate in a higher premium. But that is how uh, a straightforward mortgage insurance work. And mortgage companies can indeed calculate very precisely when the books are kept of lenders in a particular way. Uh, on year um, uh, default calculations uh, are needed. Uh, they can understand the risk and price that risk and a mortgage insurance company all they need uh, to set the premium and go to work. If that is not yet a possibility, um, but in most countries it is, uh, I, I want to uh, mention, um, but you can do what I mentioned earlier, a closed deposit account to make up miss um, by the borrower by having the borrower put upfront like six monthly payments in an escrow account so that if there is cannot pay um, that money can come out of a closed account uh, so then you basically as a lender create your own mortgage insurance uh, and that alternative worked very well for instance in Indonesia um, they still don't have mortgage insurance and that system uh, is working very well so that um, short is all I want to say about taking care of that biggest piece uh, that holds up down market movement in the mortgage lending, and that is credit risk. So in short, mortgage lending can be extended for middle and lower middle income uh, group and for informally employed. If we have concerted efforts to the competition, technology applications, um, in, uh, creating uh, creative instruments, procedures to deal with that more risky uh, customer base. Uh, then you can make a hell of a lot of money to cover that area, to cover that new segment of the market that was underserved before. To do the government such a favor, it is that that is, if you do it right, a very profitable sector. Uh, and talk to any Indian uh, housing finance company owner, uh, they make very good money on this portfolio. So um, you don't have to believe me. Uh, there are examples there. But it requires, and I talked about that, um, cooperation between different ministries. The ministries of the Ministry of Housing may have to adopt the housing law so that people that have a subsidy by the government, uh, that that property can be dealt with as normal collateral uh, and not with uh, a limitation on it. Uh, it is the Ministry of Lands that may come in uh, to um, fast forward with the new technology, the cadastre system. Uh, it is the central bank that helps you with facilitative regulation. And of course, the industry representative, but, uh, representatives. But when you all come together uh, with an outside facilitator, so much can be done. Uh, and I have been 
there. I play that role very often um, in different countries, uh, and I know how much can be achieved. Uh, it requires political will and leadership. And the question then is who takes the lead? Um, so that is in short all I want to say right now for the mortgage uh, market moving down market before we go to micro lending. So Any we received quite a few uh, questions and comments. Uh, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read them through. Some, some I think I will keep for after because they are more general. Um, uh, so, for instance, the, the recent one. All Mutual recently announced a move into creating an affordable housing fund for Sub-Saharan Africa. The role of foreign insurance across multiple aspects of the housing value chain seems like a big opportunity. Take title insurance, which seems ripe for house, uh, outsized disruption by having government, DFI, and insurer work together to create an infrastructure for driving much of the title risk out of the transaction. Do you see any promising development on this front? So that's a question from Robert. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that absolutely. And that is how it worked in India. Uh, I now do as if that mortgage insurance piece in India just was done in a year. Um, I have to unfortunately tell you all that it took more than 10 years to get this piece in place. So that is not a good example. India has a lot of good going for it, uh, but that process to establish a mortgage insurance company um, was absolutely, I, I would say, ridiculously unnecessarily long. Um, and so if you, if you begin to do that, we now have so many good examples from Morocco, from India, from many different countries, it doesn't have to take this long. Um, in Egypt, for instance, uh, the private sector took that initiative all on its own. They saw an opportunity and established their own uh, mortgage insurance company um, without uh, much just regulatory um, oversight of uh, insurance regulator, uh, but not much more doesn't have to take a long time as long as the lenders have the track record ready to price the risk. If they cannot price the risk, it's very hard for these insurance, uh, for these insurers to come up with a reasonable premium in the absence of good information that tracks the defaults on a vintage, a yearly vintage uh, way, they price the premium too high. And if the premium is high, the premium, as you know, is paid for by the customer, not by the lender. This is just protection for the lender, but the, uh, the, uh, the borrower pays the premium. If that premium is not priced well, because there is a lack of information, then of course the loan becomes unaffordable because it is an extra cost. So we have to work together. Uh, the lenders have to provide the information so that risk pricing can be done in a meaningful way uh, and the premium can be then supported by the government. The government can say we for the first couple of years pay the premium for certain segments of the population, whatever the case may be. In Lithuania, the government paid the premium um, for that part of the market that they wanted to include in the mortgage market. So the government didn't take the risk um, of the mortgage insurer, uh, that was with the private sector, but they paid the premium for five years. After five years, they felt that everyone had understood the mechanism and that the risk could be taken and the cost thank, thank could you so be much taken right. by Another the question from Taban. and the borrower. Uh, uh, so, who finance yeah. the community in the community land trust? Where do they derive their wherewithal? <laughs> yeah, that is a whole special lecture, actually. <laughs> the Community land trust mostly, mostly the land comes from government. So the government puts in the pot the land. 
We can then have um, DFIs, um, uh, but not necessarily. Um, but the land base is a communal land base. With private sector, um, with private sector characteristics. So you cannot just sell the property, as I say, individual title, but the title is limited. And it is not an ownership title. It is more like a lease. So the property as a whole has a title, but the individuals get a lease with certain restrictions on that lease. Um, and so that is basically how it works. Then the government, uh, apart from giving the land, um, service land, it is mostly land that is already serviced, that is well located, but the government, uh, and the government owns it, but it is uh, compromised, like having vacant buildings on it. Um, so uh, the government's role is to support it with a good legal framework, provide uh, service land, uh, and then a good NGO uh, normally takes the lead in administering for the long term uh, this um, in a non-profit for profit, basically, uh, uh, manages the property for the longer term. So that is how these community land trusts there is a very good book out uh, very recently. I will make the title available. I don't know quite how to communicate with all of you, uh, but I will be told that. Um, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where communal land is understood, you all understand. Uh, so why not create these community land trusts in urban areas um, so that uh, we keep of affordable housing that remains affordable in the same location for uh, several Thank you very decades. Much, Maya. Thank you very much, Maya. Thank you. You can uh, continue with the presentation. I hope I There's answered a, your question, but it is, that might be addressed there after, is a lot to it. We can, we can discuss, this, uh, discuss them after. Thank you. OK. All right, so let us then go to um, scaling up of microfinance. Um, the, a large proportion of households are not mortgageable, as we already mentioned. Um, the collateral that they have is not lienable. They have unverifiable income. Uh, a lot can be now done about it uh, so that they can enter the mortgage market. But for many, that is still not the case. They have low savings and so, uh, and there are many other constraints um, that many people face. They don't want to go to the whole mortgage procedure um, that is very, very to create a mortgage, uh, it costs serious money. So for smaller loans, that is that is hardly worth it, really. So there are different reasons, uh, and I'm not talking to that slide, why we have so many people that don't fit into the mortgage market, particularly if the mortgage market uh, is still very high transaction cost. Uh, but low-income households create very useful lump sums. Uh, it's not that they cannot save. They can, uh, and they put a lot of money towards their houses. Uh, and we have uh, done a lot of studies of looking at the poor and the informally employed to see what they put in their own houses over time. Um, and it's a lot. So you want to then begin to think how housing microfinance could bring greater efficiency to these people that are not mortgageable, but do save and do put a lot of money uh, in their home. Uh, how can microfinance make that process uh, a lot more efficient uh, for these people? Uh, so non-secure lending is mostly below five years. If you get five-year loan, is because the loan has no collateral and it is all based on your honest face and telling the lender, I will have this income stream um, for five years. Trust me. 
uh, that's all the lender gets. Uh, so therefore, long-term lending is a challenge. Uh, so most of these loans are very short. Sometimes they use mechanisms in uh, micro lending. Uh, so the group uh, promises to pay for a member who cannot fulfill the money obligation. I must tell you, I don't believe in that mechanism at all in urban areas. Urban communities are far too fluid. So I mention it here. I already mentioned right away that that sort of security for lenders is really um, very, uh, is non-existent in urban areas. Uh, but it's a uh, loan product uh, for incremental building and the improvement um, of uh, homes over time. Um, you know this type of graph very much. So a mortgage is secured by property, microloans are not uh, determined, but particularly be much, much higher risk and the higher cost of funds that a finance lender has, um, because many are not deposit taking and have no access to cheap deposits, of a loan in the microfinance uh, arena is much, much higher, uh, as uh, is, uh, can be as high as 5% per month. While uh, in the mortgage sector, uh, it is normally, uh, you know, hopefully 13% uh, or below uh, per year. So um, those are the differences. Um, what we see is that we have mortgage sector for the higher income end and for the larger loans. We have micro loans at the bottom here, and there is an enormous product gap that is not filled at all uh, at the moment. In Latin America has is at the forefront of filling this particular gap. So they have moved micro loans up in the size of the loans and in the term of the loans and mortgages they give what we call micro mortgages um, to um, that same clientele so we see a convergent uh, convergence uh, of um, this market uh, in some continents not much of that is happening yet uh, in africa so the mortgage uh, the, the non-mortgage housing loan market is tiny. It is less than 2% uh, of the 45 billion outstanding in, uh, in microfinance institutions. So even if we have a robust microfinance sector, um, special products for housing loans are tiny. Uh, they are a tiny percentage. At the same time, we know that when, men, when people get uh, a micro-enterprise loan uh, and, and uh, at least 10 to 20 percent of that loan goes to the improvement of their home. So we know that people want that product uh, and it is delivered uh, increasingly by microfinance, um, specialized microfinance institutions now, even in Africa, and by entrepreneurial banks. So I know Capitec, for instance, in um, South, South Africa um, is really expanding their microfinance portfolio, working on a very innovative, non-lean-based -lean new loan um, that can be much larger and longer term, um, but not based on the lean uh, of a property. So um, several uh, bank, uh, microfinance banks are already moving into this space. So that is very important. What are the barriers to scaling up? Micro lenders have hardly any access to long-term capital, and that is a problem, uh, really. Uh, 
many institutions are working on it. IFC, MicroBuild provide debt uh, to micro lenders for housing loans, uh, but it is still constrained. And then you have the interest rate. When the interest rate is so high, let's say it is 30% that affordable loan size for people and therefore a micro loan is not useful you cannot use it um, to to buy uh, a finished house and so you can only use it for a small extension or a new roof uh, so the leanability we have already talked about um, and there is also a lack of capacity in the microfinance sector to really adequately expand in uh, the mortgage sector. Even if they want to, uh, they have um, very little understanding uh, of how to create mortgages. So they need technical assistance uh, if they want. So here I put together <clears throat> the target return. Why are these loans so expensive? Um, and that is related to funding, uh, the expected ROE that the micro lender has to pay to the funder, um, to the, the people who pay them um, to run their business. Um, they have seldom cheap access to cheap uh, deposits, um, and therefore uh, all the money that they get is much more expensive. The loans are small. Um, the collateral is not understood, the risk is high, the operational cost is uh, therefore um, very, very high. They often have to provide technical assistance to the customer uh, for a home construction. Uh, that all adds to the cost. Um, they have to pay for bad debts. Um, and that is the picture uh, on the costing side. The effects on the demand, as I already mentioned, uh, is devastating um, because if the interest is high and the credit risk uh, is high, it limits uh, the demand for housing microfinance loans. So that is the picture uh, in most of uh, the microfinance uh, lending institutions. But there are enormously promising um, and I may be optimistic, that is in my nature. I wouldn't work in developing countries housing finance if I was not an optimist. Uh, but there are really innovations that are taking place. Um, there is now this medium term housing loan that is without a lien, um, but that is paid out. Uh, so it's a medium term and larger loan paid out to the builder or the conveyancer directly uh, that allows the rates um, to come down because it is much more secure. And that begins to take place, um, and that is already a product that is on the books of many micro builders, micro lenders uh, in Latin America, um, and is beginning to uh, be established in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. I, I know uh, from uh, South Africa particularly. Uh, it is not offered uh, yet at scale, um, but that is coming. The big part that is still not worked out in the agreements and that lenders are struggling with is that the credit risk may be high when the house is sold before the loan is paid off. So if you have a seven or 10 year loan and you sell the house at year five, what is your motivation to continue the payment of the loan? So somewhere there must be a provision uh, in uh, the agreement that the lender will be paid off first without the need for a full lien for a full mortgage registration, which would make that product too expensive. 
So um, that is the, the, the big struggle. And in Latin America, they have solved that problem. Uh, so all these uh, initiatives can be shared uh, with sub-Saharan African microfinance lenders. The promising innovation is that wholesale lending through secondary housing finance institutions is being made available increasingly uh, to uh, the microfinance sector uh, in order to begin to work on their housing loans. Um, so we have several liquidity facilities that do just that. Uh, we have SHF in Mexico, the National Housing Bank in India, in Tanzania, um, we have Pakistan doing the same, um, and so on. There are many, uh, SMF I left out uh, in Indonesia. So we have many liquidity facilities that are now extending their loans uh, to refinance uh, non-lean based uh, housing loans made by the microfinance lenders. And that up, um, that makes the cost of funding much lower, that gives microfinance lenders um, access to much longer term funding. So that really is a critical piece. Uh, I know NHFC uh, for, was supposed to fulfill that role. Uh, it was not always uh, as successful, but uh, we have uh, an institution there as well uh, that uh, can take care of that. We have um, in that space also uh, Habitat for Humanities micro build that um, works on providing debt funds to uh, the, uh, the microfinance lenders. Uh, and that is also extremely helpful. Uh, and it works uh, very much with lenders uh, all over the globe. Particularly, it has helped uh, Latin America microfinance lenders go to scale in housing loans. Uh, but it is also standing ready uh, to move in at scale in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the uh, multilaterals like IFC um, um, put in funding uh, in uh, the sector as well. So promising innovations uh, in wholesale lending um, for micro lenders, uh, we see everywhere. So really, the sector is about to begin to change drastically. And I urge everyone, uh, all the lenders in the room, to really watch that space and to see that that is a promising business for you to, to really enter. Uh, the other trend, the promising trend, is that microfinance lenders are mainstreaming. What do I mean by that? They are regulated now increasingly by the central bank. Uh, the central banks in countries that do this right have a special division to do the prudential regulation on microfinance institutions. Um, and that is very important. Uh, so um, the central banks have also regulated that the micro lenders in these countries have to provide all their credit information to the existing credit institutions um, in the country. So they um, are part and parcel of the official supervised credit bureaus and are in these databases. And as I said, all the way in the beginning, of this uh, short lecture, and that is critical. If the information on credit performance is entered in the same database as mortgage lenders use, people can get small loans, do well, pay them off, uh, improve their homes and so on, and ultimately have enough standing in the market and their incomes may have gone up to buy actually a finished house with a mortgage that they now can acquire because of their long track record that is kept in the official credit bureaus of the country. And I cannot emphasize how important that is to form a normal mobility 
in your housing market uh, and allows people to move up um, when uh, they need to move up, when their income is higher, the labor market wants them to move and so on. So Rwanda is a good example of how this system has worked. So that is uh, an, an integration, um, a formalization, I would say, of the microfinance sector that is taking place in many countries and that is extremely important. So many positive trends, I don't have to go through all of them uh, on the regular, uh, regulatory side, on the product development side, on the funding side um, and also on the subsidy side. Um, there are subsidies available now to build capacity in the microfinance for housing sector to help them with uh, product development, uh, process development. Uh, so a lot more attention is being paid to uh, the sector. There are also special rating agencies uh, that reduce the risk for domestic and international investors specialized rating agencies that focus on uh, the microfinance uh, lenders that uh, engage in the housing sector. So all these trends um, make me think the microfinance for housing sector is in sub-Saharan Africa at the cusp of really moving to a much more meaningful scale than uh, it now has. Any questions? Uh, on microfinance. No, nothing on microfinance at the moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, wonderful. That, that means that it is all clear. Maybe there are many microfinance <laughs> lenders in the audience. Uh, it's very strange to talk to an audience that you have never met. Um, so I do not know whether, whether you are all lenders, whether you are policymakers, whether you are mortgage people, um, so <laughs> educators. Uh, so I'm um, to a bit of a black box. So I, I, it's hard uh, to focus uh, specifically. All right. So, um, so that means that we now are clear on the two trends that need to happen in to give a broad segment of society access to housing finance and to create a real um, uh, uh, dynamic affordable housing sector. So mortgage down market and serving as many people uh, as we can uh, do like at least to the 50th percentile, 40th percentile of the income distribution um, and the microfinance sector coming up and offering more housing finance products so that we have that continuity in um, the affordable housing space, which we have to have in order for to come in and build at scale for individuals to build not just over 10 years, but to build their housing and pay for it over time. So that it's uh, the housing finance piece is the core uh, to develop that affordable market. But we have a major problem of affordability uh, and certainly in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm thinking here of the, the figures that you all have seen at the CAF web, website. Um, uh, David Gardner, Keisha, they have uh, put together uh, a lot of costing uh, data on um, housing affordability. How much does a house cost relative to the incomes of people? And the picture is so bleak that it makes you uh, despair. But as I say, I never despair. We have to just deal with it uh, and tackle the problem. But it is very clear that sometimes 
subsidies are necessary. And it is a problem because the governments, the local governments and the central governments in sub-Saharan Africa do not have a lot of money lying around to subsidize the housing sector. Actually, they have invested so little in the housing sector uh, in most countries, with the exception, uh, of course, of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, of um, South Africa, um, where we have an enormous uh, housing investment program. Um, but in most countries, we do not have that. Now has a big subsidy program on the books for the middle income segment, uh, but very little still for the bottom end. Uh, and very few countries have meaningful, sizable housing subsidy systems that are well structured. So we have, like in Nigeria, we have a provident fund that subsidizes mortgages um, very deeply, but that has remained tiny fund in the provident fund in Nigeria has subsidized maybe um, at the most 20,000 units uh, over the last decade. Uh, that is nothing relative to the housing demand in Nigeria. And because they offer 6% loans, uh, indeed, as I mentioned before, the private sector uh, is constrained. So there there are some subsidy programs, um, but uh, they are mostly not well structured. So I want to spend a little bit of time on how we can meaningful structure. So why do we need subsidies and who needs subsidies? Um, you have to diagnose the problems in your housing market. You have to understand who the large group of underserved households are that cannot now go to the market and acquire a house, an existing house or a new house, that is, because of the differential in income and price. Then we have to understand why that market is so incredibly poorly. How, what is wrong? What is wrong with the land market? What is wrong with the supply market? Why, uh, what is wrong with the finance, access to finance market? Um, and then create a, a common vision on how to tackle these different problems uh, on the legal side, side, on the institutional reforms that need to take place, on standards for housing, on uh, a lot of different issues that you have to tackle first before you even dream of developing subsidies. If your standards in the country are allowing only two bedroomed houses, um, you know, with full waterborne sanitation, um, don't even begin to design subsidies. You will never be able to subsidize level uh, of standards. So you have to be very realistic on your standards, on the whole uh, legal environment, so that you don't subsidize uh, to standards that are ridiculous uh, and that no you have budgetary uh, limitations. So you have to be very savvy. Segmentation of your market will show that you don't have one underserved population. You have middle income groups that don't have access to finance, that don't have access to the formal market, but actually could pay for a house if they had access uh, to finance. Then you have low income, where really uh, the low income uh, part is the most prominent as a constraint. People simply cannot pay uh, for uh, the house and cannot access the formal uh, uh, credit um, because of affordability constraints. So we have to figure out what are the constraints in each of those segments of the market uh, and where subsidies can actually play a role. It may be that the middle income um, to bring the market down um, only need 
very small subsidies to bring the informal uh, but not so poor people into this market. Um, and that um, you can subsidize the mortgage sector sufficiently uh, and the households that want to access mortgages just with small uh, subsidies to enter that market. That means that you free up um, a, a lot of money for assisting the low income um, market. It is not good to only focus on the poor because whatever you do for the poor, if the middle income market does not have access to uh, adequate supply of housing, they will take whatever housing you built for, uh, the, for the poor, they will take that. You can also not only focus on the middle income and think if we take care of that middle income part, that will trickle down the housing uh, market will gradually move down market to the poor. It doesn't work that way. Um, for the reason that I've mentioned in the beginning, we have a much larger poor community in urban areas in sub-Saharan Africa than we have middle income people. Uh, and so that trickling down from middle income to low income will always be insufficient. So the strategy in each country in sub-Saharan Africa, and I have not worked in any where that doesn't apply, has to be two-pronged. You have to help the middle, lower middle segment to come into the formal market so they can be taken care of by the private sector and you have to build up the um, and help the poor with upgrading programs with access to micro lending um, and so on. So subsidies can never be one program. So like the one Kenya now has, has to be supplemented by upgrading uh, and other policies for uh, very poor households. Um, so that is very important to understand. Uh, and politically, that's always very difficult, uh, as we see in this cartoon. Um, yes, we want to help affordable housing for the poor, but as long as it doesn't go uh, at the expense uh, of the unaffordable housing, uh, the big uh, shots in the economy um, want to make sure that the middle class is taken care of. And often a disproportionate part of subsidies in any country go to that upper middle, middle income part, and it doesn't do anything to bring down the mortgage market to underserved populations. So I always begin with a definition of how to look at subsidy. A subsidy is not a handout. A subsidy is an incentive. And it is an incentive that the government provides, provides to lenders, to developers, to consumers, to do things that they would not do without that subsidy. By lowering the opportunity cost um, or creating a potential benefit for the recipient of that subsidy. So if subsidy to a higher middle income person, the example I just gave, but that person would do would live in the same house without the subsidy or would get access to the same loan as he already has access to, you waste that entire subsidy. So that incentive part is very important. So we must see that we provide that incentive precisely to that class of lenders, developers or consumers that would do things with that subsidy that they wouldn't do without it. So if the market at the moment doesn't serve um, the informal sector and lenders will only come in to that market if the government helps them with, um, with taking part of the credit risk through 
uh, a public-private mortgage insurance. That's a subsidy, of course. When the government takes the risk, then that's a subsidy to the private sector. Um, then that will help the lenders come in. So um, that is one example of a subsidy to lenders. Uh, other subsidies to developers can be to provide free land. But then that free land piece must be incorporated in the price of the house because it lowers the opportunity cost to the developer. So if the developer takes that free land and he doesn't lower the cost of the house in a PPP arrangement, for instance, that whole subsidy is entirely wasted. So it's good to, to always keep that in mind, uh, that the lowering of the opportunity cost is a very important piece um, and that the subsidy should change behavior uh, of the of the producers of housing and of the consumer. Uh, otherwise, you waste your money and the government doesn't have money to waste. Uh, it's very important. The mistargeting of subsidies, biggest problem um, that we have with uh, subsidy design. Let's now focus on housing finance subsidies. We don't have much time for this. So let me move um, quickly. Um, we have two types of subsidies to households um, and we have uh, subsidies to improve the efficiency of the housing finance system. And I already gave an example of a subsidized mortgage uh, insurance uh, company. The household subsidies that are mostly used in sub-Saharan Africa are interest rate subsidies. Uh, Kenya implemented, I think it's gone, but implemented a cap on interest rates. That is the most inefficient subsidy, sorry Kenyans, but the most inefficient subsidy uh, you can put in place because it stops all mortgage lending when that rate is binding and therefore you do not reach a lower income group. So the cap on interest rate is a subsidy that many countries have tried and it has been a disaster in all. There is another very often utilized subsidy and that is the deduction of interest payments on the mortgages from income tax. Uh, everyone followed the US uh, because we had it and it is a terrible subsidy. It only focuses uh, on those with a mortgage uh, and the larger the mortgage, the larger the subsidy is, and it doesn't really persuade people to become homeowners at the margin. It has proven to be the worst waste of government uh, in each country that has it. And that is why the UK has phased it out. Uh, the uh, US is beginning uh, to phase it out. So these two are terrible examples. Um, <clears throat> the third way is a more normal way, reducing the effective rate through subsidies uh, to market lenders. So the government will make up the difference uh, between the subsidized rate and the market rate uh, each month or uh, yeah, mostly each month to the lender and subsidizes the rate therefore uh, for the consumer. Uh, most of the time it's for the life of the loan, which is highly inefficient. No person needs a, a subsidized loan for your entire life. Hopefully your income increases uh, in the course of 20 years of the loan. So um, I would never advise that. I would always phase it out uh, much uh, earlier. Uh, the delivery uh, is uh, rather simple. Uh, cash payment to the lenders uh, through subsidized or, or they can get subsidized funding for the entire loan. That's very expensive for the government. So they give subsidized funding for the entire loan. Therefore, the lenders can subsidize the interest rate. Um, again, I would rather use the funds of the lenders themselves and only fund the subsidized the interest rate uh, between the market rate and the subsidized rate. Um, 
why interest rate subsidies are so prevalent is that because they're so simple to implement. You just deal with the lenders, the government just deals with the lenders and they go. So the, but there are many negatives to uh, interest rate subsidies. Um, they increase with the size of the loan. So the larger the loan, the larger your subsidy. So that is not a very good way to reach lower income groups. Uh, it's inefficient for the life of the loan, but particularly a, a subsidized loan can, if the rate is really subsidized, you cannot refinance that loan. No secondary market investor is interested in the cash flows produced by subsidized interest. So when you design interest rate subsidies, you want to keep the, the market rate loan so that these mortgages can be sold or can be refinanced um, so that investors are interested in these mortgages. But subsidizing the rate as such, uh, like for instance in the Nigerian case, you cannot refinance a 6% loan. You cannot sell it in, in the secondary market. No one is interested in a 6% cash flow. So it, the structuring is very important and we are go, we're going to come back to that. Um, the most efficient, I jump over many other mechanisms, but the most efficient one is a direct demand subsidy. Um, you put, you provide a lump sum of money up front that you can apply to the down payment. And because you have an extra down payment, you can therefore lower the loan amount. Um, you can um, include in that down, in that upfront direct subsidy, uh, the closing cost, um, the insurance premium, and you can also put it in an escrow account. You say, all of you, you get this amount and you scale it according to income. The higher income receive a smaller uh, upfront amount than the lower income. And uh, you can put that money in an escrow account in the bank and disperse it over a period of five years, for instance, to help with the monthly payment. So that direct demand subsidy is by far the most flexible. If, if you design a subsidy, always think about the feasibility of that first. And they are widely used all over the world um, because of their flexibility. The cost is transparent. It comes off the budget each year. Um, and the allocation can be made to scale according to income level. So those are the two major advantages. Um, there are some issues sometimes, um, but let me not dwell on those. This is the typical structure. So you have a standard house, 5% uh, savings down payment by the, uh, by the uh, buyer, uh, a 30% subsidy, I made that up in this case, and then uh, housing finance for 65%. Um, cheating on income, you can, in order to get access to the subsidy, um, <clears throat> is prevented by, by um, making a good balance between what you can afford by way of total house. If you want a larger subsidy and therefore say that you have uh, a smaller income to get the maximum subsidy, then, the, then <clears throat> you also don't qualify for a large loan because you have given up, you have given your income as much lower than in reality. And therefore you cannot purchase the type of house that you want. So if you structure these subsidies well, you take care of cheating in the process. So that is the down payment subsidy. And this is the down payment subsidy when you put it in an escrow and pay part of the monthly payment uh, every month from that pot of money uh, in, the, in the escrow. Um, if monthly payments are the problem and not the savings. Uh, 
So it depends on the reason and people may be able to choose uh, like in Egypt between the two types uh, of uh, subsidies. The limitation of most finance subsidies um, is that they tend to be regressive apart from the on-site subsidy because they are tied to the size of the loan to the large part of the population that cannot access uh, loans. They cannot easily be applied to microloans because of the interest rate structure of a microloan. Um, so that is, those are hindrances um, for applying subsidies to housing finance. Uh, so for subsidies to the lowest income group uh, that is working with microloans, you have to subsidize that segment of the population by providing land or services, um, more supply side um, subsidies than uh, subsidies through finance. So um, I think um, I can skip uh, all of that and go to um, the last uh, slide um, and talk about what we have learned in this short session. We have learned that, uh, and now I and I shouldn't do that. Um, but what we have discussed uh, amongst ourselves is that there is great opportunity um, to expand the efficiency and the scale of the mortgage market down market. Um, there is enormous innovation taking place in the non-secured housing credit so that